Uh, we're going to start a sermon series this morning as we enter into December. This is called The Journey to Bethlehem. The Journey to Bethlehem. Amen. Uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to share a word with you today. And that word from the Lord comes out of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, as we look into the Word of God. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Thank you so much, man. If any of you ever been on a journey, you know that a journey doesn't always uh, mean you're going to get there in a few minutes or a few hours. It can take days, it can take weeks, it can take months, uh, it can even take years. But the wonderful part about the journey is the one who started us on the journey is able to get us there. Amen. So we look to the Word of God today, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. We're going to pick up reading in verse 26. Uh, I'll give you the title to the message uh, in just a minute. The Bible said in verse 26, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth uh, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph uh, of the house of David, uh, and the virgin's name was Mary. Uh, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. Uh, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou uh, among women. Uh, and when she saw him, she was troubled uh, at his saying uh, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Uh, and the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, uh, for thou hast found favor with God. Uh, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest uh, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne uh, of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called uh, the Son of God. Look back in verse 31. The Bible said, and, now I don't know how your Bible says it, but my Bible says, and, comma, behold, comma, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. The title to this message comes between and and behold, that first comma. And there's been a change of plans. Behold, thou shalt conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. There's been a change of plans. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today. God, we thank you for the blessing and opportunity to come together under your word. For the God, and Father, I pray your word would have authority in this house today. For the God, uh, Father, I pray as we read it and speak it in Jesus' name today. For the God, I pray that word would touch our hearts. Uh, it would change our minds. For the God, it would get in our hands and our feet. For the God, uh, Lord, I pray, God, that you allow us, for the God, uh, to become everything this word promises. We shall be and can be for you, God. Uh, but I thank you, for the God, that you changed the plan, for the God. Uh, the plan of my life, the plan for everybody else's life that is in here this morning, for the God. Uh, uh, there was a change of plans, and I praise you for that today, God. Uh, but I pray, God, that you'd work it out in this place this morning, Father. I pray your word would not return unto you, Lord. I pray you would accomplish uh, that which you set forth to accomplish. Uh, Father, we come to bless your name through the reading and the, and the preaching of your word, and I pray, God, that you would do just that in this house today. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and amen and amen. Everybody, please be seated. There's been a change of plans. How many of you can say today that you're a planner? You like to plan. Uh, you're meticulous about planning. I don't think many of you are planners. You don't act like you're planners. Anybody a planner in the house of the Lord today? Anybody like to make plans? Anybody, uh, anybody OCD when it comes to plans? Any, anybody uh, that uh, makes plans and, 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 and really uh, those plans are not only meticulous, uh, not only are they uh, plans that are always uh, structured and in order, uh, but those plans can often be manipulative uh, and often coercive. Now, how many of you are kind of like have a different personality and you don't always plan, uh, but you have more of a spontaneous personality? You know, you just kind of uh, fly by the seat of your pants a lot of times. 
A lot of times you just go uh, whichever way the wind blows, you just go with the flow. That's, a lot of, that's the way a lot of people deal with life, and that's the way a lot of people handle life uh, because they really don't make plans. Uh, and I, I know that God expects us to make plans. God wants us to make plans, uh, but God does not want us to make any plans uh, of where we leave God out of our plans. And too much of this life that you and I have lived uh, or will live uh, is oftentimes doing what we want to do rather than what God uh, has determined and purposed and planned uh, for us to do. Uh, When you think about plans, uh, Mike Tyson said it like this. Uh, He said everybody has a plan uh, until they get punched in the face. Everybody has a plan until somebody comes along and punches them in the face. Uh, they had a plan about how they were going to beat Mike Tyson, uh, how they, he was going to fall in that ring, uh, and how they were going to walk out the champion. Uh, and all of that was good uh, until they got punched in the face. Uh, you know, there's an old saying uh, that the, the, the plans of, about the plans of mice and men uh, often uh, go awry. You know, because they often get turned upside down uh, because what we thought was going to be one way doesn't exactly turn out to be that way. uh, And we find ourselves often questioning and wondering uh, about God uh, and God's plan uh, for our life. As we look in this passage of Scripture this morning, we find uh, a young virgin girl. Her name is Mary. And the Bible tells us that she lives uh, in in a region of Galilee known as Nazareth. And there's nothing special about Nazareth. The Bible says in verse 26, uh, now in the sixth month, the sixth month of what? Uh, If you were to read back in the first part of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, you would find out uh, that this angel Gabriel has already come one time, uh, six months prior to this. uh, He came to a man named Zechariah who was a priest, uh, and he was in the temple of the Lord serving the Lord, uh, making an offering of an altar on on incense. uh, And the angel Gabriel met him, uh, and he in his old age, uh, and the angel angel Gabriel said to him uh, that you and your wife uh, are going to have a son. And he was like, no, I don't think that's going to happen. I'm old. She's old. Uh, She's past the age of childbearing. Uh, And the angel Gabriel said, yeah, it's going to happen. And you ain't going to be able to speak about it because you're going to be mute uh, until the baby's born. uh, And you have to call his name uh, for his name uh, shall be John. And so we find that it's six months later uh, and this same angel has been sent by God uh, to, this, to this town uh, in the region of Galilee uh, called Nazareth. Uh, now if we know anything about Nazareth through the scripture, uh, we know uh, that no good thing has ever come out of Nazareth. Uh, nothing. Uh, Nazareth is an off the wall kind of place. Uh, it's in the sticks. Uh, it's up in the northern part, the northwestern part uh, of Galilee. Uh, ain't nobody good ever come out of Nazareth. Uh, ain't nothing but ill people rejects there. People been overlooked. People been ostracized. There's poor peasant people that live there. And all of a sudden God brings us his son Jesus Christ and he was raised and brought up in this town called Nazareth. You say preacher what are you saying? I'm telling you that Nazareth was insignificant. Nazareth didn't matter much. Nazareth was just a hole in the wall. Nazareth was just in the sticks until Jesus came and took hold of Nazareth. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for you? You and I, my friend, just think about the difference that Jesus has made in your life. Since you come to Christ, since the Lord come inside of you, since the Spirit of God's been dwelling with you, look what Jesus has done. You ain't the same. You've been changed by the grace of God. The blood of Jesus has washed your sins away and written your name in the Lamb's Book of life and it's all because of Jesus what a difference he's made but when I think about this young woman or this young girl named Mary she's just a girl she's maybe 14 15 years old I'm thinking I, 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 in, in years past, uh, whenever I would preach from this passage of Scripture, uh, I really couldn't relate, uh, but I better understand Mary uh, this morning. I better understand Mary's story uh, this morning uh, because Mary uh, has a plan. Mary has a plan. The Bible says she's a spouse uh, to a man named Joseph. Uh, That means she's betrothed to him. Uh, That means she is literally uh, legally uh, engaged uh, in a binding contract uh, in the Jewish culture, uh, in a Jewish marriage uh, that she uh, has already said, I do. Uh, It's just that the marriage uh, has not yet been consummated. Okay? So she's already been pledged to this young man named Joseph. 
And Mary has a plan. Because Joseph and Mary are legally bound to one another. Uh, Joseph has gone back to his father's house uh, to prepare uh, to make a house for him uh, and for Mary. Uh, and then when that is finished, uh, he's coming uh, to get Mary uh, and take her uh, to live uh, with him as his wife. But Mary, in the process of time, uh, is making preparations. Mary, in the process of time, is working things out. She's planning. She's coordinating. She's structuring. She's putting things over here and putting things over there. If this was a modern-day wedding planner, this is Mary. And Mary is setting up the venue. Mary is thinking about the flowers. Mary is talking about the food and the dresses and the suits. Mary, and the reason I understand this more today than I have in the other time it's because this is what's been in my house for the last six months especially for the last three months and as we draw close to the wire and it's just next Saturday coming up I better understand that Mary had a plan Mary had a plan and here we are in a few days we hope to see the completion and the accomplishment uh, from the plans that have been made. The fruit that would come from all the preparation uh, of putting things together, getting things in order, uh, getting this done uh, and that done. Uh, Mary uh, has a plan. But here in the midst of Mary's planning, uh, God comes along uh, with a message uh, in the angel Gabriel uh, that says, uh, there's been a change uh, in your plan. There's been a change in your plan. What do we do when we got it figured out? We got it mapped out. We're going in the direction we want to go. We got it figured out to the point that we know the destiny in front of us. We can see down the road. And we see down the road for a long ways. And we understand how it is. And where it is. And when it is. And why it is. And then God comes along and interrupts and disrupts our plan. Because God's plan is better than our plan. There's something you have to understand uh, about God's plan. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts and His ways are higher uh, than our ways. That means that God's plan supersedes our plan uh, and if we're ever going to find the purpose uh, and the promise that God has for us, uh, we have to give up our plan uh, and submit to God's plan uh, and then we can see uh, what Mary did uh, and we can have uh, what Mary had. Watch this. This is so powerful because the Bible says in verse 29 and when she was saw him she was troubled at his saying uh, and cast in her mind uh, what manner uh, of salutation uh, this should be listen to me uh, have, have you ever made plans and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a place uh, where you can't get there let me tell you something God is able to change our plans, but keep the purpose. God is able to change our plans, but allow us to still stand on the promise. That's what God is able to do. Because the purpose and the promise are still true. They haven't gone anywhere. It's just that the plan has changed. The Bible said in Acts chapter 16 uh, that the Apostle Paul was getting ready to go on his second missionary journey uh, and he chose a man by the name of Silas uh, and him and Silas uh, was going together uh, and the Bible said that they went through Derby uh, and Lystra uh, and Iconium uh, and the Bible said that they had strengthened the church uh, the church that had been brought about in the first journey uh, they strengthened them in the faith in the second journey uh, to the point uh, that when they got through strengthening the church that was already there uh, the Bible said that Paul wanted to go into Asia Minor and preach the word of God, preach the gospel unto them, but he was forbidden by the Holy Ghost. Forbidden. That means that God just didn't shut the door. God slammed the door shut. 
And the Bible says uh, that when they had come to Mysia, uh, that they desired to go to Bithynia. Uh, but the Bible says uh, that the Holy Spirit would not permit him uh, to go to Bithynia. Look here, that would have been enough for most of us. We'd have folded up the tent. We'd have packed up the bags. Uh, we'd have went back to Jerusalem. That's what most of us would have done. We just said, God ain't in this. We, we done stepped out of here. I thought this was the way God wants to go. I thought this was what God wants to do. But we done come to a place and, 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 and God has shut this door and God has shut that door. And, there, and God has said, no, let me tell you what you got to have. This is what you got to possess as a child of God on the journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever God says no, and he doesn't say no one time, he says no two times. He didn't just shut one door. He shuts another door and another door and another door and it leaves you with question marks concerning God's call and God's provision and God's promise. You have got to have an attitude and a spirit of humility about you to recognize and to receive God's no. Because too many people, my friend, uh, will be like uh, pride would swell up in them. Uh, and they would say, oh, heck no, I'm going anyways. Oh, I done come too far not to go through. I, I'm, I'm, I don't, it don't matter. Where, where was I there? I was testing about, testifying about how uh, she had already, the Lord had told her what to do. Uh, but she had said, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. Because we have a plan, and then God has a plan. But what's God's plan? Whenever he told them not to go to Bithynia, the Bible said that they were at Troas, and in the night the Apostle Paul received a vision of a man from Macedonia that was pleading with him, says, come over to Macedonia and help us, and the rest is history. Because Paul and Silas went into Macedonia, into the chief city of Philippi, and thousands upon thousands of Gentiles gave their life to Jesus Christ. Because God's plan and God's purpose, he may change the plan, but he will always keep the purpose. Listen to me, have you ever butted heads with God? Have you ever, just you and God, like two rams on a mountain, boom, boom. You ever seen that on National Geographic? Boom. Because there's only one path. And you're going this way, and God's going this way, and God wants to turn you around so you'll go His way. Boom. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, uh, if we looked at the life of the disciples, uh, listen to me, Jesus chose a bunch of ragtag guys, I'm telling you now. Uh, Jesus didn't choose the prominent. Uh, he didn't choose the powerful. Uh, he didn't choose those with status. Uh, he didn't choose those uh, that already had it going on. Uh, and listen to me, he took some fishermen. Uh, he took a tax collector. Uh, he took a loud mouth. Uh, he took a bunch who were shy and timid and afraid. Uh, he took those, my friend, who were unconfrontational uh, and didn't want to approach anybody uh, or say anything thing about anybody but Jesus took them he developed their faith and used them to change the world and we get to see Jesus develop their faith through the gospels but when you get to Matthew's gospel chapter 16 they still struggling with who Jesus really is and the Bible said that Jesus carried them to Caesarea Philippi and he asked them two questions first of all who do men say that I am Second of all, who do you say that I am? When he asked them, who do men say that I am, they answered him, and they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, or maybe one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? Only one of them spoke up. His name was Peter. He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You know what Jesus said? He said, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. He said, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. He said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter got it right. Peter got it right. 
let me help you just a minute. Because just because you got it right one time don't mean you get it right every time. Peter got it right. And Peter heard what Jesus said. And Jesus said that because of his confession of faith in Jesus, Peter's confession in Jesus, that revelation had been given to him. And now God was going to use Peter to build his church. And that Peter was going to have power and authority in Jesus' name uh, over the powers uh, and the forces of hell. Can you imagine how big Peter's head got in that moment? Verse 21 of that same chapter, right after Peter's confession and Jesus' petition of authority, Jesus said, from that time on, he began to tell his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem suffer at the hands of the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, uh, be killed uh, and raised uh, on the third day. The Bible said when Peter heard him say that, that Peter took Jesus uh, to the side uh, and rebuked him. Listen to me, you may uh, rebuke a lot of people, but Jesus ain't the one, okay? <laughs> this ain't going to go well, Okay? He rebuked Jesus and said, Lord, be that far from thee. He said, this ain't going to happen to you. You know why? Because that's not my plan. Jesus looked at Peter. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Listen, this is what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying when Peter said, that's not my plan. Listen to me. Whenever you and I choose our plan over God's plan or choose a part of our plan that God has not allowed or authorized us to operate in or walk in or seen us through in, you and I have to understand that we set ourselves up against God as one opposed to God, as opposed to the plan of God when we choose our way over God's way. Let me ask you a question. I'm just going to ask you a question. You don't have to answer out loud. But how many, how many can truly say today that you are living out the plan that God has for your life? That's a strong question. Because a lot of people, born-again believers, good Christian people, never even consider that God has a plan for my life. That God wants to do something in me and through me that he could no wise do anything else or anywhere else, uh, but God chose me. Listen to Jeremiah 29, 11. Listen to what he says. He said, for I know the thoughts of the plans that I have towards you, uh, plans of peace and not of evil, uh, to give you an expected end. Uh, he said, plans of peace, uh, to give you an expected end, a hope uh, and a future. God said, I got a plan. Whenever we hear that verse, uh, whenever we send somebody a, a congratulations on a graduation ceremony, that's the live verse. That's the live verse. That's my live verse. That's my live verse. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts, for I know the thoughts. I know the plans. You know why we like it? Because it talks about peace. It talks about hope. And it talks about a future. And we like all that. But the power of that verse uh, is not in the peace, the hope, or the future. The power of that verse is in the three words, for I know. And this is God speaking. Right. He said, for I know. You don't know. She don't know. They don't know. Uh, we don't know. Uh, for I know. Right. Listen to me. That ought to give you some liberty when it comes to relationships with other people that want to tell you what God's plan is for your life. 
And they don't even know what God's plan is for their life, but they can better see what God's plan is for your life, and they can tell you what you need to be doing uh, and how you need to be living your life and the road you need to take uh, and the education and the career that you need to have. Uh, but they ain't heard from the Lord. Uh, they just lean into their own understanding. Uh, they're just treating on the things of men uh, and not on the things of God. Uh, and they set themselves up uh, in opposition as an adversary. Uh, I know they mean good, uh, but if God ain't in it, I don't care how good a thing it is. Is, uh, it's not a God thing. How many of you know that detours lead to destination? <laughs> Good God Almighty. Detours lead to destination. <laughs> you didn't know how you was going to get there, bless God. You, have, have you ever been going through life? I mean, you, you don't have a clue. I mean, really, I mean, I mean, listen, people, I, I, wish, I wish I could tell you. I wish I could tell you. I, I, I have a great plan. <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you. I got, I got it all figured out. I got it all planned out. A to Z, one, two, three. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And we're gonna, no. No. No, no. Listen to me. I, I, I. I you got to understand something. Now, I, I'll be honest with you. I grew up in West Berry, okay? <laughs> I grew up in West Berry. I love it. Love, love the people from West Berry. Went to school, West Berry. I love, love, love it. Love it. But I'm simple, okay? I'm simple. God knows how simple I am, Okay? God knows that if he was to tell me the beginning from the end or the end from the beginning, I'd forget it by tomorrow. So this is what God has to do with me. As I walk along this journey and I go over this hill and around that curve, there's a sign that says road closed. Detour this way. So I get to the sign, guess what I do? I can read the sign. It says detour. I go to detour because I have to trust God because I don't know no other way because his word promises me that he will shut a door that no man can open and he will open a door that no man can shut. So if he doesn't want me to walk through it, then I'm trusting that God's just going to go ahead and close the door. And whenever I get there, I'm not going to stand there and keep on knocking and keep on trying to take the door off the hinges. I'm just going to go ahead and believe that this is not God's will or purpose for my life. And I'm going to go on down the road. The Bible said in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9 that a man in a man's heart, he decides his ways. But his steps are determined by the Lord. They're directed by the Lord. We, we make a lot of decisions in our heart. But you better bet, irregardless of whether it was a right decision, a wrong decision, a good decision, a bad decision, or whether it was a decision in God's will or out of God's will, God is still able to get you to the intended destination because the promise nor the purpose changes even when God's plan changes. There's something else I, 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 I understand more about weddings today than I did three months ago, six months ago. And that is that whenever you order a dress or you order a suit, it doesn't come tailor-made for most of us. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you order it and it comes, you always got to take it somewhere. And get somebody to do something to it. Get the seamstress to take it up a little here. Let it out a little bit there. Do a tuck. Whatever, whatever they're doing with it. Cover this up. Let this go. Whatever they're doing with it. All these alterations uh, have to be made. All these alterations have to be made. <laughs> God fits us for the journey. Okay? 
Whenever we start on the journey, God fits us for the journey. He fits us and prepares us for what he wants us to do in this season, in this time of his journey, our journey with him on the road to his destiny for our lives. He fits us for the journey. But how many of you know that what you used to wear, you can't wear no more? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you go ahead and you go back and get them skinny jeans and see what they look like now. <laughs> you can't get a leg. In. <laughs> you know why? Because just because it fit then doesn't mean it's going to fit now. You at a different place in life. You at a different season in life. You at a different place on the journey. It's not the same mile marker that you was at five years ago. And what fit five years ago not necessarily fit today. Jesus said it like this. Jesus said you can't put new wine in an old wine skin. He said you can't take a new garment and new patch and sew it to an old garment. He said the wine skin will bust and you'll lose the wine or the new patch will tear away from the old. And what I'm trying to tell you is uh, that whenever God fits you for the journey, uh, not only is God changing you, uh, but when God changes the plan, uh, you got to change your mind. You can't, you, you can't get to where God wants you to go. To do what God wants you to do. To carry out the plan God has for your life. If you still got the same old mindset you had, Five, ten, fifteen years ago. Listen to me. <laughs> I'll just give you an illustration. Whenever you was with Jimmy, it, it didn't it didn't it didn't go too good. You and Jimmy, y'all was all right for a while, but all of a sudden it got polluted, it got contaminated, and it really played with your mind. And something happened in life, and all of a sudden, you and Jimmy ain't together no more. But then there'd been Teddy and Freddie and Bobby. <laughs> and Teddy and Freddie and Bobby come along in your life, but you did the same thing to Teddy, Freddie, and Bobby that you did to Jimmy. Come on, come on. Because even though God brought you into a new relationship and wanted to bless you in this season of your life, uh, you still had the same old mindset uh, of where it was contaminated and polluted uh, with Jimmy to the point, my friend, uh, that you can't have uh, what God wants you to have uh, and receive what God wants you to receive. Uh, you got to change your mind. She said in verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, uh, seeing I know not a man? Then the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called uh, the Son of God. She said, Now, I, I, it, it, listen to me. Mary has been given, I, I mean, this is one, this is the mystery of God that's been revealed to Mary. This is a mystery of God that's been going down through the Old Testament uh, from the time uh, of Genesis chapter 3 uh, in which God said he would put enmity between uh, the, the man, between the woman and the, and the serpent uh, and how through the seed of the woman uh, that God would bring about a savior uh, into the world. Listen to me, this has been going on and on and on. And, and we've seen, we've seen through the Old Testament uh, some glimpses uh, of this one uh, that, that has come. Oh, we've seen some glimpses. We've seen him uh, come to Abraham uh, and talk to him uh, as Abraham sat in his tent door. Uh, they called him uh, the angel of the Lord. But he is the one who was and is and is to come, always has been. He is the ancient of days, uh, and he has always been. Uh, he made everything, and by him was everything made. Nothing was ma there is nothing that was not made that was not made by him uh, and for him. But watch this. We see him again with the three Hebrews in the fire. He shows up as the fourth man in the fire. We see him come to Joshua 
as Joshua was sitting on the edge of the promised land uh, with his sword drawn as the captain of the host of the armies of Israel. Uh, we've seen glimpses of him uh, throughout. Uh, we've seen uh, where he even come uh, in Genesis 32 and wrestled uh, with Jacob uh, at the fort of Jabuk. And the Bible said that Jacob said, tell me your name. He said, who are you? They wrestled all night, uh, and Jacob wouldn't let go of it until he blessed. He said, tell me what is your name. Uh, but he never told him uh, his name. Uh, he just told Jacob who he was. He said, thou art Jacob, but from now on you're going to be called Israel. So we've seen these glimpses. But all of a sudden in Luke's Gospel chapter 1, we get to hear his name. The angel says, blessed are you, highly favored, blessed among women. He said, thou shalt conceive. <laughs> he said, there's been a change of plans. <laughs> thou shalt conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name uh, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. We get, a, we get to know his name huh, before he was ever born. We get to know his name huh, before he was ever conceived. Huh. We get to know his name huh, before God ever placed himself in the womb huh, of this Virgin Mary. Huh. His name huh, is Jesus. Huh, and that is the name huh, that is above every name. We've sung about that name. Huh. We speak that name. Huh. We claim that name. Huh. There's authority in that name. There's forgiveness in that name. Huh. There's love in that name. Huh. There's deliverance in that name. Name, huh? For the name of Jesus, huh? the King of Kings, huh? and the Lord of Lords. Huh? There's no God huh? like our God, huh? and His name huh? is Jesus. You know why His name's Jesus? Because it means the same thing that Joshua does in the Old Testament in the Hebrew. It means Savior. <laughs> Savior. Because the book of Acts chapter 4 tells us that there's only one name under heaven given by which men can be saved. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. Jesus said himself in John's gospel chapter 14, uh, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You're not going to get there any other way. There's no other way but Jesus. And she said, how shall this be? I, I, I understand. It, it wasn't that she didn't understand. She understood. She knew they wasn't no stork. She knows she ain't stupid. She knows how this thing takes place. She understands that how a baby comes. She understood. So she said, how can this be when I know not a man? In the very next verse, the angel Gabriel says, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. I, I don't know who this is for, but please get this. Take it home with you. Chew on it. Receive it. You don't need what you think you need or who you think you need for God's plan to be fulfilled in your life. Because there are people that have compromised who they are just to stay in a relationship with somebody uh, because they think they need that somebody. Uh, they need that person, that relationship, uh, that connection in life uh, to get them to the destiny uh, that God has for them. Uh, but God says you don't need anybody else uh, but me. Uh, all you need is the Holy Ghost. Uh, all you need is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, all you need is to know God uh, as your Father. Uh, and God will get you there. I promise you on the authority uh, of God's Word. Uh, this is the journey uh, to Bethlehem. Uh, and there has been a change uh, of plans. Listen to me. You may have come in here one way today. And you may not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You may not have ever accepted Him Ask Him for forgiveness of sins, repented of your sins, and accepted Him as the Lord and the Savior of your life. And that's okay. 
because there's been a change of plans. God's desire is that you not stay in your sin, but that you repent of your sins and you call on the name of Jesus. And the Bible said that they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, friend, if you want to leave this place different than you came, and you want to be able to testify to people in this house today, to your family, to your friends, to your co-workers, to your neighbors, there's been a change of plan. The devil had me going one way. But God arrested me today. He took hold of my heart. He washed me with his blood. He forgave me of my sins. And he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Maybe that's you today. Friend, I want you to leave with a testimony that there's been a change of plan.